Hey y'all, Coach in the Fight here, looking at Command 12 out of the Shepherd of Hermes. This is the last of the commands or the last of the mandates out of the Shepherd of Hermes. This one is about of the twofold desire that the commands of God are not impossible and that the devil is not to be feared by them that believe. Now, <clears throat> this section, it covers uh, more than we're going to cover. I'm not going to go through this whole chapter. You see, it talks about... Uh, that the, that the commands of God are not impossible. Um, that's kind of in the wrap up in the conclusion. I'm only going to cover the first 11 verses, which is talking about the twofold desire. All right. So we're going to jump right off into it at verse one. It says, again, he said unto me, remove from the all evil desires and put on good and holy desires for having put on a good desire. Thou should hate that which is evil and bridle it as thou wilt. But an evil desire is dreadful. And hard to be tamed. He's talking about those things that we want in life. Those things that you wake up and you say, I wish I had this and I wish I had that. Some of these things are good for us and some of them are bad for us. And we're going to find out why here in a minute. You're going to give us a little bit more uh, information. But remember, these are mandates. These are commands. And he's simply telling us to stop having bad desires. But he's just going to go into and explain it a little bit why we should you know, stop having bad desires and only have good desires. Let's look at verse 2. It is very horrible and wild, and by his wildness consumes men, and especially if a servant of God shall chance fall into it, except he be very wise, he is ruined by it. For it destroys those who have not the garment of a good desire and are engaged in the affairs of this world. And delivers them unto death. Talking about those bad desires. He's going to give an example of the bad desires. Uh, um, um, adultery is a bad desire. Um, um, and wanting to be super wealthy is a bad desire. But what he's trying to tell us here. Some of these desires are going to lead you unto death. If you can't control them. They're going to lead you unto death. And then he's talking about those. What does he say? For it destroys those who have not a garment of a good desire. And are engaged in the affairs of the present world. Now this is command 12. We heard in the previous commands um, how being engaged in the present world. We, we would call these people worldly people. Which most of us are here in 2019. We have to admit that we are worldly people. Cause, you know, So that we could try to get on track. It's like an alcoholic. You have to first admit that you are an alcoholic before you can ever want to recover. Well we have to admit that we are worldly people if we ever want to get right again. All right. And he's saying that the, the, when we are worldly, these bad desires can have a uh, deathly effect on us. It can lead us into death. And that's why he's putting this in his command. Look, almost every one of these verses is in the word death. But let's look in the word. Let's look at verse three. Sir, said I, what are the works of an evil desire which bring men unto death? Show them to me that I may depart from them. Here said he, by what works an evil desire bringeth the servant of God unto death. All right. So <clears throat> now this is Hermas asking the angel of repentance. He's he's saying, okay, now if these if these uh, evil desires are going to kill me, please uh, explain them to me. What what it, what do you mean by all of this? Help me out because I don't I I want to um, I want to be right. This is Hermas. He is, you know, he is a really good guy. Um, the way the story goes is he was kind of walking along and these these angels, the angel of repentance, the angel of punishment. And he, he even, he, you know, he he actually comes in contact with these angels that starts teaching him these virtues so that he can then write this book that we all can learn these virtues. And that's so what you're hearing is the back and forth conversation between these two. But let's look at verse four. He says, first of all, it is an evil desire to covet another man's wife and for a woman to covet another's husband as also to desire the dainties of riches and multitude of superfluous meats and drunkenness and many delights. These are some of the examples of the evil desires. Right. And you can you can see how they can be how they can drag a man into death, especially when we when we understand that that's the way it starts off is we start thinking about such things like another man's wife. And if we can't stop ourselves from thinking about that man's wife, we're going to end up making an action. We're going to end up doing something. And that's what this chapter is about. That's what this mandate is about is to stop thinking about that man's wife. If you ever find yourself in a position 
uh, and what it says the dainties of riches if you want to be really really rich or it says a uh, multitude of superfluous meats meaning different kinds of food or want to be drunk if you can't stop the desire to want to get drunk you're going to end up getting drunk right and you know we we find that all over the scripture that you know being a drunkard is one of the things that will, pre will prevent you from getting into the kingdom of heaven so if you know if if you if you, if being a drunkard is one of those things that you are uh, that you struggle with and you find yourself you know on the road to recovery where you you know you you aren't you know being so drunk all the time and and and, and you 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 are you're praising the father and you, you're giving yourself a little bit of credit for having accomplished that day of getting over the drunkenness you haven't took taken a drink in a while but then all of a sudden one day you wake up and you're like you know what i want to drink well if you don't curb that if you don't stop that as soon as it pops in your head we're about to find it out in a second i believe in these verses if you don't stop that immediately it's going to overwhelm you and you can say well if i if i don't stop thinking about riches am i going to end up you know getting rich yeah you are you're going to end up doing those things to help you get really really rich the only problem with that is in order to get really really rich you're going to have to put away um you're going to have to become worldly. You're going to have to put on stuff like arrogance. You're going to have to put on stuff like selfishness. You're going to have to put on um, um, those kind of negative virtues in order to become wealthy, in order to become rich. The father, he'll make you rich himself. He'll make you wealthy himself. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about you wanting to become rich on your own, not him doing something for you, but you trying to do something for yourself. And that's going to lead you into error. It leads, it leads us into error if we can't control those thoughts. All right, let's look at verse five. He says, for in much delicacy, there is folly and many pleasures are needless to the servants of God. Such lusting, therefore, is evil and pernicious, which brings to death the servants of God. For all such lusting is from the devil. Yeah, this is the devil trying to take us away from where we're supposed to be. Remember, we're supposed to be humble. We're supposed to be meek. We're supposed to... Um, be satisfied with those things that we have we've heard that all the time even the reverend pastor deacon dr doug tells us that we're supposed to be satisfied at least some of them do tell us that we're supposed to be satisfied with those things that the father has has given us already well the devil comes in and he's going to try to tell us that that stuff ain't good enough you know that our wife ain't good enough that we need this other wife over here or that the food that we have is not good enough we need that food over there you know and and so these these lustings are coming from the devil he's getting into our thoughts and he's he's trying to steer our thoughts away from the father and steer them back into worldly stuff and if we can't control them he's going to end up there if we can't stop those thoughts we're going to end up end up going back uh, to that worldly stuff let's look at verse 6 whosoever therefore shall depart from all evil desires shall live unto God but they that are subject unto them shall die forever for this evil lusting is deadly do thou therefore put on the desire of righteousness and be in arm with the fear of the Lord resist all wicked lusting all right. So, yeah, that's what he's saying here is that we, will, we these these evil lustings are going to take us to death. Now, I can't remember. I think it was over in Revelations where it was talking about or it was naming all of those people that are not going to see the kingdom of heaven. You know, it, it names liars. It names the doubtful. It names uh, whoremongers. It names drunkards and a whole bunch of people. Well, a lot of those, you know, can be attributed back to our desires. You know, we wanted to be uh, um, um, those things. We, we at one point, they, the, the, the thought of those things came into our mind and we ran with it. You know, we, we decided, you know, we were going to drink. We decided we were going to fornicate. We decided we were going to, you know, do these errors. We didn't put off the, the bad thoughts and they overwhelmed us. It says, for this evil lusting is deadly. Those things are going to take us to death, guys. And that's why it's important that we control these desires, that we stop them. The second we see them pop up in our head, we need to squash them. You need to get them away. That first thought is not going to be sinful. You know, that's that's the devil working with us. You know, he he's coming in and he's he sprinkles that little evil thought on us. Be That first thought is not going to be deadly. It's the second one and the third one and the fourth one and the fifth one. Let's go on to verse 7. For this fear dwelleth in good desires. And when evil coveting shall see the armed with the fear of the Lord and resisting it, it will flee far from thee and not appear before thee, but be, a, 
but be afraid of thy armor. Now here it is telling you how we're supposed to do it, how it is that we're supposed to get away from these these bad desires. And that's like we said, is to is to reject them as as soon as they pop in your head to reject those evil desires to put on good desires and what does it say here when when the when the devil or when those evil desires see you um resisting see you putting up some type of resistance it runs it flees it runs away it don't want to have any part it does it's like it doesn't want to be defeated and so as soon as you know satan sees you trying to show some resistance he runs away and gets away you know, and so the evil desires goes away. And so that's why it's important to curb those evil desires when they first occur, because if you entertain them, you know, they're going to multiply. They're going to keep coming, you know, more and more with, with more thoughts. And then, the, 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 you know, the devil has a lot of ways he can help you, especially when stuff like adultery and stuff like that. He can start putting pictures in your face. He can start bringing other adulterous people around you that, you know, can can help encourage you to do such thing. Or he could even bring the women around you even a little bit more. So it's really important to get ahead of those thoughts and to squash them, nip them in the bud, you know, kind of thing. All right, let's look at uh, verse eight and thou shalt have the victory and be crowned for it and shall obtain to those desires, which is good and shall give the victory, which thou has obtained unto God and shall serve him and doing what thou thyself wouldest do. OK, so once we have learned to, you know, recognize the evil thoughts, anything that wants to take us back to uh, worldly stuff, you know, like superfluous meats or covetousness, things that we don't have, you know, once we learn to, to do that. Then we you know we will get the victory. We we can then go. What does it say? And be crowned for it, and shall attain to that desire which is good. So we'll start to get our our the good things that we want. We can have those good things that we that we want. It's just that you know having our minds focused on those bad things is what's going to make it hard for us to get to get those good things. But let's go on to verse nine. For if thou shalt serve good desires and be subject to them. Then thou shalt be able to get the dominion over the wicked lustings, and they shall be subject to thee as thou wilt. Meaning if we can control that, and I know I keep saying it over and over, the scripture keeps saying it over and over because it's extremely important. We have to nip it in the bud. What does it say? For if thou shalt serve good desires and be subject to them, then thou shalt be able to get the dominion over the wicked lustings. Now you have to pay really a close attention to the way the word is written because, you know, the father, he chose his words very carefully. And when he say, if then, this is an if then statement, you can count on that if then. If you do this, then you will have that. So if if we can concentrate on good desires, then we can have uh, dominion over bad desires. The opposite is true, too. If we can't serve the good desires, then the bad desires are going to take us over. You know, let's look at verse 10. And I said, sir, I would know how to serve that desire, which is good. Hearken, said he, fear God and put thy trust in him and love truth and righteousness and do that which is good all right <clears throat> now there's a lot this, it's a lot going on in this in this in this verse here you know a lot of this stuff will blow past and you know oh, i'm just going to love truth and righteousness but we don't really know what that is we don't know what that means especially a lot of us who have found ourselves down in the church environment those these things have been twisted up you know what does uh romans 10 and 1 say people have gone off i think it's 10 and 1 that says people have gone off to create their own righteousness you know a different kind of righteousness people have their own righteousness in their mind so but what he's talking about is true righteousness which is following the covenant following the commandments doing those things which the bible tells us to do remember down at the church they tell us you know those rules are antiquated we don't you know supposed to be you know doing any of that stuff anymore because that was for you know the jewish people or whatever they try to tell us down there well what this is talking about this is talking about legitimate righteousness the real righteousness and when they say love truth it's talking about the truth of the word not the truth of the reverend pastor deacon dr doug which he thinks anything any thought that pops into his head is, is the truth of god and it's just not you just talking about the word the truth is actually written down when he says fear god and uh, put trust in him. Fearing God and putting trust in him is talking about his laws and his rules. If you aren't doing his commandments, you don't you aren't fearing him. If you know the commandments tell you to uh, to honor the Sabbath day and you like, you know what? I got something to do on the Sabbath day. I'm going to just do that. There is no fear of the father there. You know, if you had fear of the father, it's like a parent. When a parent tells you to do something, you're going to do it. He said honor the Sabbath day. You'll do that. But if there is no fear there, you won't be doing it. And it says put that trust in him. Yes. Yeah, 
but putting their trust in the word. You know I mean, in John chapter one, verse one, it says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word is God. So he's talking about the, the he's talking about the word here. When you talk about putting your faith or putting your trust in God, you know, when you talk about putting your faith in God, really what he's talking about is putting your faith in the word, putting your faith in, you know, the scripture and what it says there. All right, let's go on. This is the last verse, I believe. Thou shalt be an approved servant of God and serve him. And all others who shall in like manner serve a good desire shall live unto God. All right. <clears throat> now, this live unto God part, he covers this in, in another section of the book. It's, it's, it's kind of a coded message here when he says live unto God. What he says is that all creatures fear God, even the animals, you know, even even dogs, you know, have a fear of the father. They kind of know that, you know, something, you know, you know, something can come out of lightning and come or, you know, they, they actually fear. But not all creatures follow his commandments. And remember, the scripture says that life belongs to those who keep his commandments. So that's what he's talking about with here when he say you shall live unto God. And these are the mandates that will help us to live unto God. These these are the things that we're supposed to be doing now. <clears throat> In closing, I'm going to say, you know, this is the 12th mandate. He's going to go on to give a summary here in verse 12. We're going to pick that up in the next section where he's going to cover the, the last the last section. But there's one little thing I want to say about Hermas before I close it out. And that's how this book was once a part of our our uh, canonized books. These were one time at one time. They were included in the scripture before 1611, of course, when the um, King James Version came out. But long years ago, this was considered a holy scripture. But I guess somebody, you know, uh, read that section on the false prophet and decided that, you know, they was going to take it out. You know, if they didn't, it was going to end up costing the Vatican a whole lot of money if they didn't take that part out about, you know, desiring money or whatever. But <clears throat> the thing about it, these are the commandments. These are the rules. These are the rules that were set in the second era. This is a second era book. There was supposed to be in a New Testament, not the Old Testament. Those laws came from Moses talking about uh, Exodus and Leviticus and Deuteronomy and Numbers. But in the uh, New Testament, we were also supposed to have commands and man ma mandates telling us how to live, and these are it. These is what they were. These twelve commands and man mandates, and you can go back. We've covered, you know, the other ones on our channel leading up up so far. They're kind of rough, but you can go back and listen to them. But these are the commands and stuff that we're supposed to be keeping for the second era. In other words, we always supposed to know this. The Reverend Pastor Deacon Doctor Doug is supposed to have been telling us about these commands all the time. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. I'm gonna kind of cover all of that in the next uh, section where we kind of wrap it up down there and so go ahead and hit that bell button hit the subscribe button and the bell button <clears throat> And so you can get that uh, class when it comes out. Go ahead and leave the like. Go ahead and uh, hit the like button and leave a comment if you don't mind. All right, y'all. I'm going to close it out with that. Jesus is Lord. Yahashua HaMashiach is our father. Hermes Academy. And they are the same. Love you guys. Power, patience, continence, and faith. We teach virtue.